Good evening, everyone. I'm Michelle Leifer, and I'm the director of the USAN Institute for Animal Health Education at the Schwarzman Animal Medical Center. Along with my colleague, Kimberly Young, I'd like to thank you for joining us for tonight's event, The Cat's Meow, with Dr. Jonathan Lassus. Tonight's event will be recorded, and we'll send out a link tomorrow in case you miss anything or would like to share it with a friend. We'll be taking questions via chat, and we'll make sure to save some time at the end of the presentation to answer as many as possible. I'd like to take a quick moment to let everyone know about an upcoming event. On Wednesday, November 8th at 6 p.m., AMC's Dr. Elizabeth Appleman will join us to discuss diabetes in cats and dogs. You can find more information about that event and all of our events on our website, amcny.org slash events. We'll also have the link in the newsletter that goes out this evening. And now it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker. Dr. Jonathan Lassus is an evolutionary biologist known for his research on how lizards rapidly evolve to adapt to changing environments. A lifelong feline enthusiast, his, in recent years, Dr. Lassus has focused his evolutionary biologist training on our household friends, exploring what scientists have discovered about where cats came from, why they do what they do, and what the future may hold. Dr. Lassus graduated from Harvard University and received his PhD from the, the PhD from the University of California. After a postdoctoral stint at the University of California, Davis, he moved to Washington University for his first faculty position before leaving to become a professor of biology at Harvard and curator at, at the university's Museum of Comparative Zoology. In 2018, he returned to Washington University to become the founding director of the Living Earth Collaborative, a partnership between Washington University, the St. Louis Zoo, and the Missouri Botanical Garden. Dr. Lassus has written more than 250 scientific pa papers and three books, most recently, The Cat's Meow, How Cats Evolved from the Savannah to Your Sofa. We are thrilled to have him here with us to tonight tonight to discuss this book and all things feline. Please welcome Dr. Jonathan Lassus. Well, thank you very much, Michelle. It's a pleasure to be here and thank all of you out there who've tuned into this. And let's see if I can get the screen uh, shared correctly and get this thing going. So you should be able to see a picture of my book and nothing else. Hopefully yes. That's correct, there we go. All right, let's go. Um, many of my friends and colleagues are, were surprised when I published a book on cats, and Michelle gave the reason why. I, I'm a scientist. Oops, I haven't. Uh, sorry. Let's share the, get this presentation in full screen. There we go. Ah, I screwed up already. My apologies. One second more. All right, now we're ready. The reason people were surprised is I have spent my career studying lizards, their behavior, their ecology, and evolution. And my fascination with lizards began when I was a little boy. I started uh, with dinosaurs, quickly graduated to reptiles, and have been fascinated with them ever since. But at the same time that I discovered reptiles, I also fell hard for cats. It all started when I was five, when we adopted a rescue Siamese from a local shelter to give to my father for his birthday. Two years later, we adopted another rescue Siamese, and ever since then, I have been crazy about cats. Nonetheless, as my scientific career developed, it did never cross my mind to do anything scientifically with cats. And there were two reasons for that. First, I wanted to go out into nature and to observe animals as they went about their lives. Anyone who has tried to follow a cat around knows just how impossible a task that is. As soon as the cat figures out what you're doing, which is usually right away, the cat gives you the slip, disappears into the vegetation, and is gone for a couple of hours. So cats just didn't seem to be a good organism to do research on. Moreover, I was under the impression that there really wasn't any interesting research being done on cats. And by cats, I mean domestic cats, not jaguars and lions and tigers, but pets and feral domestic cats. Well. 10 years ago, I discovered that I was very wrong about that. In fact, there are a large number of cat scientists who were using the latest techniques to study cats 
cat biology, doing the same, using the same methods that I use with lizards and colleagues use with elephants and eagles and all kinds of other animals. Everything from GPS tracking to, to genome sequencing to chemical isotopic analysis. So once I learned that there was a lot of interesting cat science going on, I had what I humbly submit was a great idea. I would teach a freshman class, you know, students in their first year in college called the science of cats. And the idea is I would lure students in because they are interested in cats and then teach them how we study nature just using cats as the vehicle. Well, the course went really well. We went out at the crack of dawn to, to observe a site where community cats, unknown cats were fed. We went to a cat show. We even visited, oops, it's backwards. There's an art museum behind there where students are looking at a, a centuries old pot with a cat painted on it as we learned about cats in art history. So the, cl the, cats, uh, sorry, the class was a great success. And so it wasn't much of a leap to think, why not write a book with the same goal? Tell the many people who are interested in cats about how scientists study cats, how we know what we know about them, and how science itself works. And so that's what I did. And what I'd like to do today is to tell you uh, a few of the interesting topics that are, are discussed in my book. And I'll start with the book's title, The Cat's Meow. Anyone who has lived with a cat has experienced cats meowing to us. They clearly are trying to tell us something. But what is it? That's, that's the question. Well, I always assumed that cats meow to each other to communicate. And by meowing to us, they were just including us in, our so, in their social circle, treating us as honorary cats. But it turns out that that is not the case. That in fact, scientists who have gone out and studied colonies of free ranging cats doing the same thing that Jane Goodall and other scientists do, that is just watching them and doing, taking notes on what they do, have discovered that cats do not usually meow to each other. They only rarely communicate by meowing. Now they make many other sounds, they hiss and growl and so on, but they don't meow to each other. And what that indicates is that during the domestication process, cats have evolved the tendency to meow to try to communicate to us. Now that might suggest in fact, that cats, that domestic cats are the only felines that meow, that they involved, they evolved meowing behavior when they were domesticated. However, a quick look at the internet indicates that that is not so. For example, here is a bobcat, and hopefully you can hear this sound. That's a little more guttural to, than your, your normal house cat, but that was a meow. Or here's another species, one of my favorites, an, an African species called the serval. No doubt about that one. In fact, almost all small species of felines do meow. So the domestic cat did not invent the meow. It just started using it to communicate with people during domestication. And that leads to two further questions. First, has the domestic cat's meow evolved from that of its ancestor? And secondly, is variation in the meow meaningful? Well, it turns out that these two questions were researched by a graduate student at Cornell University 20 years ago, Nicholas Nicastro. Now, as you can see from this photograph, this, is, these, this photograph Nick sent to me, and it shows you what a character he is. I must say, one of the most fun things about writing this book was talking to cat scientists and getting their stories, how it is that they became uh, cat scientists. It turns out that no one sets out to spend their life studying cats. It just kind of happens by serendipity. And so it was, it was fun learning the backstory of all this research. Well, let's go through the two questions that Nicastro asked. First, has the cats, uh, the domestic cat's meow changed from that of its ancestor? Well, the ancestor of the domestic cat is this species here, the African wildcat. I'll tell you how we know that later on, but for the moment, take my word for it. As you can see from the photograph, African wildcats are not very different looking from domestic cats. And in fact, I like to think that if you saw a cat like this walking through your backyard, your, your first thought would not be, what is, a, what is a African wildcat doing in Hoboken? Rather, I think you would say, what an interesting looking cat. I've never seen one quite like it. That's how similar they are in appearance and anatomy to domestic cats. And as we'll see, their behavior is also very similar. 
So Nicastro was interested in how the African wildcat's meow, what its meow sounded like. And so to find out, he traveled halfway around the world to the zoo in Pretoria, South Africa, where they breed African wildcats. And so he went out and he, uh, he recorded the calls of the, the meows of the African wildcats. And what he found was that they were very different sounding from that of a domestic cat. They were uh, they were had a lower pitch and were longer in duration. And he actually played recordings of these calls to a variety of, of people who helped him in his research. And, and the people could definitely tell the difference between an African wildcat and a domestic cat. <clears throat> Excuse me. And that is, he would play them the, the sounds without them knowing which it was, and they could definitely tell them apart. And they rated the domestic cat's meow to be much more pleasing to the year, ear. So very clearly, the domestic cat evolved its meow. It changed in such a way to make it more um, something that we would be more attracted to. And so that is one way in which the domestic cat has evolved. Their, their meows have changed. And the Castro's second question was, is variation in the meow meaningful? Now, again, anyone who's lived with a cat knows that they have different meows that they use in different circumstances. And Presumably, those different meows have some meaning. They use one meow in one, one time and another at a different time to try to tell us different things. But is there a universal language of meows? Do all cats have the same meow when they're hungry and a different meow when they're sleepy or so on? Well, to test that, Nicastro went to people's homes and recorded the meowing of their cats in five different contexts. So he recorded each cat in all five contexts. One was a content cat being petted by the person with, it, with, it, with which it lived. Uh, another was a cat confined to a space that it wanted to get out of. A cat that was about to be fed. A cat that was in, was in an unfamiliar space, specifically in the Castro's car. And finally, a cat that was being brushed backwards. In other words, was being aggravated. And so he recorded the meows from, all the, from each cat that he studied. The first thing he deter determined was that cats did have different meows. He could tell that, he, he analyzed these calls with the computer or these meows, and he could tell that they were different meows, but there was no consistency from one cat to the next. That, that is, they didn't have the same meow when they were content and the different, but the same meow when they were about to be fed and so on. There seemed to be no universal language. So what he then did was he played the meows to to people who listened to them. And he asked people that, to determine what context do you think that cat was meowing in? Could people understand the meows? And the answer was no. They, their responses were basically no better than guessing. So clearly there is no universal language of cats that they use to express different, different things that they want. However, the same study was then repeated by a British scientist named Sarah Ellis but she added one difference to this study. And the difference was she included the people in the people who listened to the sounds, the person who lived with that cat. And it turns out that the person who lived with the cat was able to tell the context of the meow about 60% of the time. And so what that means is that cats develop a private language with the people with which they, they live. Somehow they, they negotiate an understanding that I'm gonna use this meow when I'm hungry, and this meow when I'm upset, and so on. And so the cat, the meows do have, are meaningful, but it's not a general meaning. Rather, every person and their, and their cat develop their own understanding. Well, clearly, cats have evolved, uh, oh, I'm sorry, what about the, the other marquee sound of cats? And that, of course, is the purr. And the first question we might ask is, do other species of felines purr? And the answer is absolutely. Again, here is a serval, the African wild, the African cat. Very familiar. The same, the same sound that domestic cats make. And in fact, all small cats purr. Large cats cannot purr because uh, they can roar, and the and the same throat structure can't do both. Well, it turns out that. Cats, domestic cats also have two types of purrs. One of them is the purr that a, a content cat makes, the, the sound that 
is so familiar and so beloved to all of us. When a cat is in your lap and you're stroking the cat, and it makes this very pleasant brr, brr sound that, at least to me, is very heartwarming. But there is a second sound they make that is more when they want something. And again, many people are familiar with this. Picture you go into the kitchen, you open a can of wet food, and the cat comes in and is rubbing against your legs and is purring in a very loud, demanding way. And in fact, the, these two purrs have names. They're called the content the contentment purr and the solicitation purr. And they were studied by another English cat scientist, Karen McComb. So let's first listen to some of the purrs. This is a contentment purr. That's the very pleasant sound we, we understand. But here's the other purr. Next slide. The solicitation purr. It's a very much louder, a, a sort of like a, a chainsaw, brum, brum, very loud and demanding. And in fact, people who are who hear these different purrs rate the solicitation purr as being both less, less pleasant, but also more attention grabbing, more demanding. So there are these two different sorts of purrs. And so Macomb then did a analysis where using the computer, she looked at the the shape, the digital shape of the of the purrs. And she found that there was one major difference, which you can see circled on the screen in red, one component of the purr present in the solicitation purr and not in the contentment purr. So I thought this was very cool. She had been able to identify, identify what actually is different between the two types of purrs. However, the next thing she said in her paper, I was a little dubious of. She argued, What she pointed out was that the, the, the component that's present in the in the solicitation purr has the same audio spectral qualities as a human baby crying. Now, as you, as you know, humans are innately attuned to the sound of babies crying, that we are very sensitive to that sound and it gets our attention. And so the idea that Macomb suggested is that cats have hijacked this sensitivity by including a baby-like sound in their purrs to get our attention when they really want something. This seemed going a little too far. I mean, sure, you can see the differences, but to say that they actually sound like a baby crying sounded far-fetched. But then I listened to the audio file she provided again. And you know, I think I could hear a baby crying. So you decide for yourself. About half the people I asked say that they can hear a baby crying there. So if you're not sure, you can find call, uh, purrs like this on the internet. Go back and listen for yourself. Well, with that, uh, we that, that the cats have evolved their meowing behavior and their purring behavior as part of the domestication process to better live with us and basically to better get us better able to get us to do what they want us to do. We might ask then, are there other cat behaviors that have evolved during domestication? Certainly cats do all kinds of unusual things. They sit in boxes, they chase laser points, they go nuts over catnip, they knead or make biscuits, and they bring toys for play. Now, all of these seem like behaviors that wouldn't evolve in wild species, and so they might be candidates for behaviors that have evolved from domestication, behaviors that are different from their ancestors. But let's go through these one by one. Do cats, uh, wild species of cats, that is wild felines, sit in boxes? They most certainly do. If you do a little Googling, you can find almost any species you think can think of sitting in a box. What about chasing laser point dots? Well, look for yourself. This tiger is showing the same behavior as a domestic cat, maybe a little slower, a little more stately, but uh, he's definitely chasing that laser point, as do many other wild species of felines, though not all. Do big cats like catnip? To ask the question is to answer it. They go through the same behaviors, drooling and rolling around and seemingly in a trance, just like domestic cats. What about making biscuits or what's called kneading behavior? Many of you have experienced this. A cat, an adult cat will start alternately lifting its paws left and right, pushing down on your belly or on a blanket. It's both adorable and annoying, especially when they stick their claws out. But why do they do that? Well, it turns out this is a, a behavior that kittens of all feline species do when they're nursing. 
presumably it's used to help stimulate milk flow in mama cat. And for some reason, domestic cats as adults have retained this behavior. It's probably involved with bonding uh, with the people they live with. Now, as far as we can tell, other species of felines do not do this behavior, although the literature on this is, is not very extensive. It hasn't really been studied, and you would need a, a wild species that lived with humans to really test the idea. But this may be a candidate behavior that has evolved uh, during domestication, a topic certainly uh, worth future re further research. Well, there's one more candidate for uh, this behavior, and that is bringing toys for play. Uh, years ago, my wife and I got a new cat a, named Nelson, a European Burmese, and we brought him home, and very shortly, uh, he, he started doing this. He would go and get one of his toys and bring them to me. He's walking up to me. Here he is, and he drops it right at my foot right now and looks up and says, it's playtime. And then if I picked the toy up and threw it down the hall, he'd run after it, get it, and bring it back. Basically, he was fetching. Now, we hadn't trained him to do this. He picked this up entirely on his own. Well, we thought that Nelson was the world's greatest cat. And in fact, he is, but not for this reason. Because I had all these grand visions of going on The Tonight Show or having the, the Nelson YouTube channel, fame and fortune to follow. But then it occurred to me, maybe I should check whether this is known, a known behavior in other cats. And it turns out there's actually a scientific literature on this. People have studied this a little bit by, by surveying cat own, people who live with cats. And what they found is about 20% of the people said that their cats did the exact same thing. They fetch toys or they bring them to play with. So this is a behavior that many cats uh, exhibit. Nelson is special. You'll have to take my word for it, but maybe not for this. Now, this also seems like a behavior that is unlikely to be uh, shown by wild, by wild felines, by lions and mountain lions and ocelots and so on. And I asked zookeepers if cats in their care did this, and they weren't aware of it. So this, too, may be a behavior evolved by domestic cats. But again, it's hard to actually know. But finally, there is one behavior I haven't yet mentioned, which definitely is something that evolved during domestication, and that is has to do with their tail, and particularly the tail up display that cats, uh, that cats exhibit. And this is a sign of friendliness. And let me illustrate with another of my cats, Archie. And this is what Arch I'm calling to Archie, and here he comes. And as he approaches me, as he gets close, up goes the tail, swing, and he comes and rubs my leg. The tail up display is a sign that cats use to each other to basically say, I come in peace, I wanna be friends. And it's a sign of, of friendliness, often followed by rubbing their head against each other or, or the side of their, of the, each other, of the cat's sides. This is a behavior that they certainly do treat us like other cats, doing the same thing to us that they do to other, to other cats. So it's a sign of friendliness. Now, some scientists wanted to test this more scientifically to test, is this actually a sign of friendliness? And to do that, they took advantage of the fact that of a little known fact about cats. And that is, if you show a cat a silhouette on a wall, they will initially think it's a real cat. Now they quickly figure out the ruse, but for a few moments, you can actually uh, get, you can judge how they would react to a real cat. And so what the scientists did is they got a cutout of a cat shown here with its tail up, put it on the wall, and they introduced a cat to see what it would do. Or half the cats, got the same treatment, but the silhouette had the tail down. So it was an experiment. What does a, a tail up display, what response does a real cat do? Well, the answer was very clear. When the tail up silhouette was used, the real cat would stick its own tail up and approach very quickly. But when the tail was down, the real cat would not stick its tail up, would not approach very quickly, and in many cases started lashing its tail from side to side which as many of you know, is a sign of uncertainty or nervousness. So very clearly, the tail up is a sign of a cat of friendly intentions. Well, interestingly enough, there is only one other species of feline that uses a tail up display as a sign of friendliness. And all other species do not. 
And I'm going to give you a second to, to think. If I were in person, I would ask people to shout out what species of cat they think does that. So you'll just have to think to yourself. OK, here's the answer. Lions. Lions also use the tail up disp display as a sign of, of friendliness, the only other cat to do that. Now, domestic cats and lions may seem like an unlikely pair of felines to share this unusual behavior. But in fact, there is a ready explanation and one that highlights perhaps the most significant evolutionary leap domestic cats have made from their wildcat ancestors. And to understand why, we need to talk about lion behavior for a minute. As no doubt all of you are aware, lion, lions are famous for being the only social species of wild feline. They live in social groups that interact with each other in friendly ways. Such groups, of course, are called prides. Now, prides, the, the core member, of, the core of lion prides are the females, and the females are all related to each other, mothers and daughters, cousins, granddaughters, and so on. And the reason is that when lions grow up, the males leave the pride, but the females usually stay put. So the females are all related to each other, and they're very friendly. They lie on top of each other, they groom each other, they play with each other, they even nurse each other's cubs. So lions have a very social behavior. And we can see why they then would use the tail up display, because they are around other cats all the time. And so when they're approaching another lion, they want to send out a signal, I come in peace. But what, what to use for that signal? They can't use their legs because they're walking on them. The whiskers are too small. The ears are too small. The, the tail is doing nothing else. It's the perfect signal to use. And so that's undoubtedly why the lion uses it. Now, the question is, why do cats, why do domestic cats do the same thing? Well, the answer has to do with a misconception that many people have about cats. Cats are often considered to be loners non-social, aloof individuals. I, and in some circumstances they are, but in other circumstances, they can be very social. They can, they can live in groups that are very friendly with each other. And where this occurs, here's some cats are with the tail up display. Where this occurs is when cats live in very large, hot, very dense populations. And that occurs in places where there is a lot of food. For example, in many places around the world where people put out food for unknown cats to eat, as undoubtedly happens in whatever city you're living in. These community cats, you put out a lot of food, you'll have a lot of cats. It also occurs in fishing villages where there are a lot of scraps that the fisher people throw out and they attract large numbers of cats and you have these very dense colonies. Well, in these colonies, cats live together and they form social groups that are very similar to those of lions. These social groups are composed of related females because the females stay put and the males leave. And just like lions, they are very friendly. They groom each other. They play with each other. They lie on top of each other. Not only do they nurse each other as kittens, but sometimes they assist in, in during the birth process. So domestic cats sometimes can form very social groups, very similar to lions. I should point out as well that, that you will have multiple groups in one area and members of the group are friendly to each other, but not to, to cats in the other groups. They're quite unpleasant to those cats. So it's clearly they're only very friendly to their related individuals. So cats can be a very social species, very much like a lion. Now, I think that a group of cats should be called a pride, and I don't know why we don't call them that. Instead, they have a term called a clouder, which is a dumb term that no one knows where it came from. But I, I propose what, from now on, we call groups of cats a pride. In any case, there is one major difference between cat prides and lion prides, and that is lions are famous for hunting in groups to bringing down very large prey, such as buffalo or even giraffes and elephants, not full-sized elephants, but mid-sized elephants. Uh, this is something that domestic cats don't do. And all I can say to that is, thank goodness. Imagine a pack of cats bringing down groundhogs and raccoons and so on. But that is one way that a cat pride and a lion pride are different. But in many other respects, they're very similar. Well, on that note, I'm gonna to switch to the second half of the talk, which is about cats past, present, and future. How, where they came from, what's happening today, and what the future may hold. The deep history of cats uh, the cats started with this species here called Proilurus lemonensis that lived about 30 million years ago. As you can tell from this reconstruction, they look pretty much like modern day cats. 
that their their legs may have been a little short, but anyone who saw this cat would have had no no uh, difficulty in recognizing it as a member of the Felidae, the family, the cat family. And in fact, that is a hallmark of felines. That for the for the greatest uh, for the large extent, all feline species are very similar. Sure, they may be larger or smaller. There's difference in color and pattern. Maybe their legs are a little different. But for the most part, a cat is a cat. They seem to have found a winning formula 30 million years ago and stuck with it. Well, what happened after Proilurus evolved? For about 10 million years, not much happened, as far as we can tell from the fossil record. And then 20 million years ago, the cat lineage split into two groups. Uh, one of those groups in red here are the saber-toothed cats, and the other cats, the other group are the what they're called the conical toothed cats or the non-saber toothed cats. And this is what our modern cats are all members of this group. But let's talk about the, the saber toothed cats for a while. The largest cat in the world, as far as we know, ever was the South American saber toothed cat, which grew to a weight of almost a thousand pounds. That's the size of a polar bear. What an enormous cat. And they must have been incredible, incredible predators. In North America, we had only a slightly smaller species, Smilodon fatalis, that lived in the American Southwest, even in what is today Los Angeles, until about 10,000 years ago. What that means is that the first people who came to North America encountered saber-toothed cats. That, they came that close to, uh, to living with us today. Um, in fact, for much of the existence of felines, the saber-toothed cat diversity was greater than the conical toothed cats. There were many more saber toothed cats, and why that is, we don't know. But towards the end of this time, the saber toothed cats went extinct. Why that is, we're not entirely sure, but probably part of it is that humans wiped out a lot of the large species that they ate the giant ground sloths, the elephants, and so on and they lost their prey and may have gone extinct. It is kind of interesting to think about, though, what if things had gone backwards? What if the saber toothed cats had survived? and the other cats had gone extinct. Well, I'd like to think that something like this might have happened, that we would have domestic saber-toothed cats as our pets today. I have to, at this point, have a shout out to the illustrator of my book, David Tuss, who made, did some fabulous drawings. And this, this is my favorite one. But in any case, sadly, there are not yet any saber-toothed house cats. We could talk about whether that will ever happen. And there are no saber-toothed cats at all. So let's talk about the existing cats. Scientists have come up with the evolutionary tree of, domestic, of, of, the, of wild felines by sequencing their DNA. And this evolutionary tree suggests that the common ancestor, the most recent common ancestor of all living felines occurred about 11 million years ago. And from that common ancestor, today there are 42, that, that number on the slide it has been updated, there are 42 species of wild felines. Now, many people are surprised to learn that um, because if you think about wild, uh, wild species, everyone knows the big cats, lions and jaguars and leopards and mountain lions and so on. There are nine large species of big cats, but that leaves another 33 small species of cats. And again, if I were with you in present, I would ask you, who can name some small species of felines? And think about that for a minute. Uh, the two that get shouted out right away are the ocelot and the bobcat. But not many other people don't come up with many others. In fact, who's heard of species such as the Oncilla, the marbled cat, the Andean cat, the flat-headed cat, the jungle cat, the rusty spotted cat? There are a plethora of small species of felines that are very little known, and most people have never heard of them. There are, in fact, many of them, mostly in Africa, Asia, and South America. And in theory, any one of these species could be the ancestor of the domestic cat. And so that leads to the question, which species is the ancestor? Well, I've already told you, but pretend I didn't tell you. Uh, the answer is the wild cat. Now, I need to emphasize that the wild cat is the name of a species. It is not just a wild cat. It is a species, Felis sylvestris, the wild, the wild cat. It was long suspected to be the ancestor of the domestic cat because it looks just like one in many respects. Um, but the DNA studies confirm that, that if we look at this box down here, we see that the domestic cat and the wild cat are the closest relatives to each other. That appearances in this case are not misleading. The domestic cat, it does descend from the wild cat. But that doesn't solve our question entirely because then the question is, 
Which wildcat? There are three generally recognized species, the European wildcat, the Asian wildcat, and the African wildcat. And in, uh, sometimes these are considered different species, sometimes different subspecies. Um, doesn't really matter. We could talk later about uh, why we, which is correct or why we think that. In any case, it was unclear which was the ancestor of the domestic cat. And so to solve that question, an American graduate student at Oxford, Carlos, Carlos Driscoll, set out to get the answer. And to do that, he, he traveled all over the old world, collecting samples of domestic cats and the wild cats that lived there to compare their DNA. Here, for example, he is in Western Mongolia, visiting some Kazakh eagle hunters who train eagles to catch cats and foxes, which they then use to make coats uh, to, to live in the very cold place where they live. Now, it seems kind of mean, but they have to make a living somehow. Let's just put that aside to say that Carlos not only tried on this coat, but was able to get DNA samples from 40 wildcats as a result. So in very many different ways, he collected samples from a thousand domestic cats and wildcats. And the first finding of his study was he understood the evolutionary relationships of wildcats. And to his, the, uh, to his surprise, there were some unexpected findings. First, there is not one species of African wildcat, but two. African wildcats are genetically highly divergent between a South African and a North African species. They're so genetically different that they're clearly different species, but they look very similar. The second unexpected finding had to do with this animal, the Chinese mountain cat, a beautiful species from the Himalayas, very little known, that was thought to be similar to a wild cat, but not a wild cat. But the DNA shows that clearly the Chinese mountain cat is just a type of wild cat. It is, the Asian wild cat is more closely related to the Chinese mountain cat, but, which makes sense, than it is to other types of wild cats. So in fact, there are five types of wild cats. And that leads to the question, which one was the ancestor of the domestic cat and where did the domestic cat originate? And we could imagine a, a, couple, a couple of possibilities. Maybe the European wildcat is the ancestor. That is the one that looks the most like domestic cats. Or maybe it's the African wildcat. Or maybe it's all five of them. Maybe the domestic cat was domesticated in multiple places around the world. This is actually quite common. It's been demonstrated in pigs, in dogs, and in other species where they were, they were domesticated multiple times in different places. Well, Driscoll's DNA data answered the question definitively. It is the North African wildcat that is the ancestor. The DNA of North African wildcats is almost indistinguishable from domestic cats. Very clearly, that's where the domestic cat uh, originated. Now, this actually makes sense geographically because the blue color here is the range of the North African wildcat, which is sometimes called the Near, Near Eastern wildcat because, as you can see, its range extends into Western Asia as well. And the fact that the domestic cat originated there makes perfect sense because of this region here. This region is sometimes called the Fertile Crescent. This is the area in the world in which civilization first began, that people settled down, they stopped being hunter-gatherers, they, uh, they started growing crops to feed themselves, and basically the origin of agriculture and civilization. And here is a reconstruction of what that might have looked like. Well, like all good farmers, uh, the people in the Fertile Crescent, they grew as much food as they could during the good season and stored the excess amount in these granaries to use during lean times. And of course, you know what happens when there's a lot of food lying around like this. It attracts rats and mice. And in turn, what do the rats and mice attract? African wildcats. These cats are no dummies. They saw this abundance of prey. And at least some of the cats, the ones that were the boldest, if you will, the most willing to be in a place where humans occurred, took advantage of this food. And you can imagine that uh, cats that had this tendency would have more kittens because they had more food and they would pass that trait on to their descendants. Now, in turn, the people seeing the African wildcats were doing them a service, probably encouraged them. Maybe they put out some food, maybe a, a bowl of milk, which isn't actually good for cats. Maybe they would let them into their huts where it was warm and dry. And again, the cats that were most predisposed to be tolerant to people would enter the village, enter the huts, in turn, people started petting them. Kittens are adorable. Again, this favored the, the cats that were most tolerant of people. And over time, the cat became 
the, the wild cat became the domestic cat. That is the, the scenario by which domestic cats likely evolved in the Fertile Crescent. Now, I do need to make a point, and that is that there are other, that just living around people in itself does not cause domestication. Look, think about these species that live around us today. None of them have become domestic animals. I don't think they're on the way to, uh, to becoming domesticated. Maybe they are. Actually, the pigeon has become domesticated. Uh, but being a, able to live around people is perhaps the first step in the domestication process, but it doesn't, uh, it doesn't necessarily become a domestic animal. And along those lines, I need to, to talk about a little terminology about what I mean by domestication. Domestication is the process by which animals and plants are modified by their interactions with humans in a way that benefits us. And, I, and in particular, by modified, I mean they have evolved through genetic changes that result in behavioral, physiological, and anatomical differences from their ancestors. And so I want to emphasize, they have evolved. This is a, as much evolution as what goes on out in nature. They are changing. They are adapting to their new circumstances. And I want to make a distinction between domestication and taming. A tame animal is biologically no different from wild members of the same species, but they behave differently simply as a result of how they were raised. In other words, if you raise an animal and treat it well, it will be tame and be okay to live around humans. For example, you can tame wolves. I'm not recommending it. They don't make, they're not great, but you can tame them. But these tame wolves are no different than wild wolves in the wild. They have not evolved in any way. Wolves, tame wolves are not dogs. And so it's an important distinction and you'll see why in just one minute. So where exactly did cat domestication occur? Well, the first uh, idea, the traditional idea is in Egypt. And the reason is that paintings and sculptures on tomb walls show them clearly in a domesticated context about 3,500 years ago. There's one with a, with a collar on, another eating from a bowl underneath a table, and so on. Clearly, they're, they're domesticated by then. But there's another candidate, and that is Turkey. And Turkey has been suggested for a couple of reasons. First, People in Turkey love cats today. Istanbul is, is call, calls itself the city of cats, or sometimes it's referred to as Cat Istanbul. And maybe some of you have seen the movie Keddy about cats in Istanbul, which is a lovely documentary. But there's also some real scientific data, and that comes from the nearby island of Cyprus, which has the first archaeological evidence of cats and people in association. This is a grave site from 10,000 years ago. It shows about a 30-year-old person buried with a lot of treasured objects. And at the foot of this person is this. Now, you can't see it all that well in the photograph, but the scientists kindly provided a drawing. It's a eight-month-old cat that was very carefully buried in a shallow grave at the foot of the person. Now, this person had been buried with treasured objects like axes and, and colored beads and so on. The implication was the cat was another treasured object. And so that suggests an association 10,000 years ago. But the problem is, we don't know if that was a tame wild cat or a domesticated cat. Their skeletons are identical. And so it suggests maybe domestication goes back that far, but maybe not. And so the bottom line is we don't know whether domestication occurred in Egypt, in Turkey, or maybe throughout the Middle East. Um, but we do know what came next. About 1700 BC, cats started spreading out from the Middle East, undoubtedly hitching rides on ships, or maybe not hitching rides, maybe being pressed into duty as rodent control officers. So they show up in Greece, and that's evident from archaeological remains. Then they get to Rome, and from Rome, they spread to the rest of the Roman Empire. And it is usually attributed to the Roman Empire, the cats going along that they got throughout Europe, and then to the rest of, well, to North America and Australia and so on. However, a fascinating study published just a couple of years ago provided a new wrinkle. And this was a study by an Italian graduate student named Claudio Ottoni, now in, uh, doing a postdoc in Belgium. And what he wanted to do was to sequence the DNA of cats, cat specimens in archaeological exhibits to try to trace the genetic spread of cats through time. And so to do that, he collected cat specimens from archaeological sites, as you can see, from throughout Africa, Europe, and Western Asia. And this sh just shows the age of these specimens, ranging from as far back as 
as almost 10,000 years ago to the present. And so he sequenced the DNA of all of these specimens. Uh, he, he, in the end, he got 352 specimens, including 74 mummies from uh, natural history, from, from museums. It turns out that the Egyptians made a lot of cat mummies. Well, I won't get into that story. It's a fascinating one. So he had all of these archaeological sites, he, and he got the DNA from them. Now, when this paper was published, I expected it to create quite a, quite a sensation. I mean, ancient DNA uh, from, from cats. And uh, in, in fact, it did go viral, but not in the way I thought. I thought cat mummies would be irresistible to the, to the media and to the public because they're beautiful, some of them. Here are some from a museum. But it wasn't cat mummies that got all the attention. It was something else. It was Viking cats. There were memes like this throughout the world's media which went wild over this study and the possibility of what they were calling Viking cats. Well, what, the, what was that all about? It turns out that one of Otoni's study sites was this town in what is now Northern Germany, Ralswick. And around 700 AD, when the, 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 the site was, that's the age of the site, the Vikings lived there and they had cat skeletons in their remains. And so Otoni sequenced their DNA and the expectation, of course, is that they would have the same DNA as the cats that had been spreading out from Rome, that they finally got to northern Germany. But that's not what he found at all. Quite the contrary, they had DNA very similar to Egyptian cats. And so what that suggested is that the Vikings had gone down to the Mediterranean in their longships and had picked up some cats there. Now, they probably didn't go down there for the cats. They went down there for other reasons. But some cats hopped aboard, and they carried them to northern Europe. And that's how cats got there. The Vikings spread them out and then probably spread them to Iceland and Greenland and who knows, maybe even North America. So that's the story of how cats spread through the Western world. Meanwhile, while Otoni studies also showed they took a, a marine route to India, whereas archaeological data also demonstrate that they traveled on the, on the Silk Road, working their way east till by 600 AD, they had covered most of Asia. Well, that's, that's how cats conquered the world. I'd finally like to spend the last couple of minutes talking about the future of cats. And the first aspect of that I want to talk about is something called the Cat Genome Sequencing Initiative, 99 Lives. It's, uh, it's based at the University of Missouri in Columbia, which is not too far from where I am here in St. Louis. And it's run by the appropriately named Leslie Lyons, probably the world's leading cat geneticist. And what she is doing is she is sequencing the genome of cats in order to try to discover the mutations responsible for genetic disorders, just like the Human Genome Project is working to find a genetic basis of, of human diseases. This effort has been very successful. To give you one example, there's a disease called polycystic kidney disease. And this is the one that Lyons actually started working on. Originally, it was found in 38% of Persian cats. Now, at that time, Persian cats were the most popular breed of cat, which made this the most important genetic disease of, of all cats in the world. Well, uh, Lyons found the, the mutation that causes polycystic kidney disease. I should point out that this is a, a, a really horrible disease that afflicts both cats and people. PKD causes the formation of cysts in the kidney that eventually lead to renal enlargement and ultimately kidney failure, so proving to be fatal. So she found the mutation that causes it, and the importance of this discovery cannot be, uh, cannot be overestimated. Uh, it allowed her and others to come up with a screen of cats to find out if they had the, the mutation. And this screen was useful in two reasons. First, it could tell you if you had a cat that was likely to develop PKD. And so you could take prophylactic measures earlier on, feeding a special diet and treating them in ways that would pro, uh, prolong, make it prolong before the initiation of disease. But perhaps even more importantly, you could screen cats and simply not breed the ones that had this mutation. And that's what breeders started doing. And as a result, the mutation was weeded out of the population and now it has a much lower prevalence uh, in the population. So a huge success by finding the mutation for this disease. And it turns out there are benefits to humans as well, because it turns out that, that the genome of cats and that of humans is structured in very similar ways. There are a lot of genetic similarities, which means that 
Uh, for, for example, in this case, the same mutation causes the same disease. And so what has been learned about cats is now being transferred to help come up with remedies for humans as well. This is also the case with another mutation that Lyons discovered, which is the mutation responsible for this breed of cat called the munchkin. This is, a, uh, as you can see, this is the corgi of cats. It's a typical looking cat from the belly up, but it has very short legs. Now, you might wonder why some people are attracted to this. I will tell you this, it apparently has no health problems, unlike dogs with a similar anatomy, but for cats, they're structured differently. It doesn't seem to be harmful to the cats. And there's now a breed that's developed from this. And Lyons in her lab has discovered the mutation that causes it. And there may be uh, there may be application to understanding humans that have a very similar mutation and a very similar condition. I finally want to point out uh, that there is a whole industry that has developed tests that you can take at home to look for disease-bearing mutations in cats, also for dogs, uh, but we're talking about cats here. And you can go out and buy these. They can also perhaps tell you something about the ancestry of your cat, although that's a little dubious. But you can screen for many genetic traits to see if your cat has them. I just want to point out that this entire industry is based on the work of Leslie Lyons and her colleagues. And it's a clear example of how pure scientific research can lead to unexpected commercial outcomes. Well, with that, I want to go to the last topic of my uh, talk, and that is what does the future hold? How will cats evolve in the years to come? And the first question I want to ask is, are cats already evolving? As you may know, there are feral cat populations living on, in the wild, completely independently, all around the world. And these cats are experiencing many different conditions. In Australia, for example, where there are 2 million feral cats, some of them live in the outback, in the scorching hot and dry desert, where they have to deal with heat and lack of water. Others live in the mountains of Tasmania, where it's very cold and snows in the winter. One of the recent findings in evolutionary biology is that evolution can occur very rapidly when environmental conditions change. And this is, and it's very likely that cats are evolving to adapt to their different circumstances, hot and dry, cold and wet, cats on islands are eating big prey like seabirds. Undoubtedly, cats are experiencing new selective pressures and they're probably evolving. Surprisingly, this has not yet been studied and we don't know if, they're, uh, if they are evolving. I predict that they are. There is one particularly interesting example, and that is, it has to do with the famous, uh, the famous black panther or black leopard. It turns out that 14 species of felines have populations that have all black individuals called melanistic individuals. And almost invariably, these, these populations live in dark forests where the black uh, coloration provides camouflage. There, in recent years, this uh, cat was discovered in Madagascar on what's called a trail camera, an automatic camera, found this all black cat. When scientists first saw it, they thought it might be an entirely new species, but they captured some, looked at their DNA. It's clearly a domestic cat that's gone feral. And where do they live? In dark forests. And so that suggests that feral cats living in dark forests are evolving to have black color, just like many other felines. Well, I think this is a ripe area for future study to understand how cats are adapting to their new circumstances. And of course, this is very important because cats in some places are a real problem preying on native species and in some cases causing uh, threatening them with extinction. So the more we can learn about how they're adapting, the more important that will be. Well, what about the deep future of cats? You know, eventually, hopefully humans will stop destroying the environment. Nature will recover unless we completely annihilate all life on this planet. Eventually, we'll get over it. Nature will recover. The question is, what about species like tigers and ocelots? Will they still be around? We can hope that they will, but who knows? However, it is certain that one species will still be around, and that is the domestic cat, Felis catus. There are currently almost one billion cats in the world, of which several hundred million of them, at least, live as feral, unknown cats. Un undoubtedly, they will survive, and they will be the basis of future evolution. Consider that they live on every continent except Antarctica. They're on many islands, and they're occurring in many different habitats. There will be many opportunities for them to evolve and adapt. Three million years ago, a cat entered South America and produced seven descendant species today. Or if we go back 
to Proilurus, which evolved 30 million years ago, and look at its descendants today. I predict, I think confidently, that given enough time, the domestic cat will lead to a new evolutionary radiation of felines. Will they look like the ones today? Maybe yes, maybe they'll evolve in new directions. Maybe saber-toothed cats will reappear. Who knows? But I think it's safe to say that we will have cats and they're most likely going to be de descended from the domestic cat. Well, let me just uh, follow, conclude with two things. One is, oddly enough, my book was published in the United Kingdom with a different title and a different cover. I just find that interesting. They're exactly identical on the inside, but turns out the Brits have different sensibilities about what makes a good title and a good cover. Well, with that, I want to wish you a happy National Cat Day, three days from today. I hope you will celebrate accordingly. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much. This was fascinating and I learned so much and uh, I can't thank you enough for your time. We do have a few questions, which we'll get to. Um, let's see. So first we have a, a question about feral cats. Are feral cats domestic cats living in the wild or are they wild cats evolving to domestic cats? Well, uh, as I answer questions, I'm going to show you this uh, video yeah. of my cat, Archie, just because I like it. So two answers to that question. Number one, it's a little unfortunate, but the name of the species, scientific name Felis catus, is the domestic cat. And so that includes not only pet cats, but feral cats. They're all the same species. Uh, a Felis catus, and it's not the greatest name. So yes, feral cats are domestic cats. They are not the wild cat, Felis sylvestris. I guess that, that would be the answer. Okay, great. Um, we have many people saying wonderful presentation and thank you. Um, we had a, a Diane um, sent a comment earlier that when you put up the, the silhouette picture of her cat who usually ignores her screen, jumped up at it. So, which was interesting. really interesting. Yeah. Um, let's see. So it, a couple more. So why does my cat howl at night? Well, <laughs> I, you know, that's a hard one without knowing more about your cat. Um, hard to say. Let, let me answer this in a sideways sort of way. Uh, people think that cats can't be trained. That is absolutely untrue. The cats are very food motivated and you can train them to do all kinds of things. Uh, but cats are also very smart and they learn to train us. And so I'm gonna guess, this is just a guess, that you respond in some way to the cat howling that the cat gets what the cat wants. Um, and so maybe it's trying to say, let me out, or I wanna be petted, or I want food or something, but Cats, uh, when I was growing up, uh, our cats scratched the furniture. We did a very bad jo job of training them. And so my dad would, when they were scratching the furniture, he would catch the cat and throw it outside. Well, very quickly, the cat learned to go to the, go to the couch, take one paw up and go scratch and run to the door <laughs> to get let out. And so basically the cat had trained my dad to let, uh, let him out when he let her out when she did that. So maybe that has something to do with the howling. We actually have um, Hannah followed up with that, that she said that um, he howls at night with a toy and comes to bed. So weird. So yeah. Oh. So, okay. Interesting. interesting. They're such wonderful and puzzling creatures. They are. They are. Um, let's see. Uh, do cats need a lot of space in the house and should they be taken on walks on a leash? Um, thoughts on that? Cats definitely need space. And uh, not only do they need space, but they need things. That, they're very intelligent animals. They need things to keep them occupied and to keep their minds moving. They need. They like getting up off the ground. They need places where they can have some seclusion, especially if they're multiple cats or dogs or children. So they need a rich environment to keep them mentally stimulated. Now, is it a good idea to walk at your cat? If your cat will do it, great. It's a, a an easy way to take them outside, let them experience the sounds and smells of nature uh, without them being at risk of getting run over or running away and without them threatening wildlife. So if you can do it, great. And some cats will do that all the time. Other cats, you put put the uh, the vest on them and they, um, they just flop over on the side and refuse to do anything. My cat, Nelson, was happy to have a leash on him, but he would 
just take three steps and sniff and sniff and then take another three steps. And it was incredibly boring. So I gave up on that. <laughs> but some cats I've seen just go walking along the sidewalk. Oh, that's great. Um, uh, what are your thoughts about the crossbreeding of wild and domestic cats, like the savannah produced from crossbreeding with the serval? Well, that is a fascinating topic and one that I actually talk about a lot in my book. And I just I didn't have enough time to talk about it. It's fascinating scientifically. And um, the reason it's fascinating is that the serval and the domestic cat have been evolving separately for almost 10 million years. And so they should not be able to interbreed because they should, it's just too much time. And usually different species can't interbreed. They, but the serval and the domestic cat can, and they can produce, uh, they can produce fertile females. The males are, are sterile, but the females are fertile. And then if you breed that female with a domestic cat, for several generations, you'll end up with something that um, the males and females are fertile. And that's how they created a new breed called the Savannah. Uh, also one of the most popular cats today, the Bengal, which is gorgeous, was created by crossing the Asian leopard cat with domestic cats. And the interesting thing about that is the Asian leopard cat has a nasty disposition. And so who had the idea of crossing that with a domestic cat who knows? Um, but it's, it's worked out in the end. Now, is this a good idea? Probably not, um, for a couple of reasons. I mean, why, why are we messing with nature, number one? Number two, many cat species are highly endangered, and to go and take cats from the wild and bring them into uh, captivity just to create a pet is a, is a bad idea. And in fact, most of the cat organizations now have banned the the recognition of new breeds based on crossing domestic cats with wild cat or with wild species. So that was a long answer to say it's a scientifically interesting phenomenon, but I really don't think it's a good idea. And I agree we shouldn't do it anymore. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, we had a question about ear tufts. Um, that why are they in some breeds and and not in others? Well, there's two answers to that. One is cat breeding, which is a controversial topic um, for many reasons, but there are people who who breed cats to look like all kinds of different cats. A, a mutation pops up and they say, I would like my breed to look like that. And so they have bred them to, to have ear tufts or many other conditions like the munchkin with short legs. So in many cases, breeds of cats have ear tufts just because breeders wanted to do that. However, some cat breeds originated from populations of cats that lived outdoors, you know, before, in, in, you know, in, in the last few centuries. And so, for example, the Maine Coon is derived from cats that lived, they were domestic cats, but they weren't indoor cats. And so they evolved by natural selection, a very thick coat to be warm in Maine. And the same thing happened in what's called the breed that's the Norwegian forest cat, that the domestic cats there lived outside and evolved lots of hair, including tufts on their ears. And so in that case, it's probably part of just being a very thick, hairy animals because they lived in very cold places. Interesting, a, a side note, kitty litter was invented in the 1940s. I did not know that, but before the 1940s, you could not have an indoor cat because they had to go outside to, to do their business. Oh, wow. Yep. Um... And I know I just want to mention to everyone that you, even though you covered a lot of ground, there's much, much more in the book. So if you haven't read it yet, please do. Um, I think you'll, everyone will really, really enjoy it. Um, let's see, there's there's so much to cover. So, okay, is listing domestic cats as non-native and invasive a justified characterization considering TNVR prevents invasive multiplying? Well, this is a hugely controversial topic in, in several ways. Um, let's start in Australia, where there are many cats that are not part of TNVR colonies, that they're living out in the wild where people aren't around, and they're doing a lot of damage to, to natural ecosystems. There are a number of species that have gone extinct, and cats have played a major role, and they're threatening other ones. So they clearly do qualify by the definition of an invasive species. And that's also true in many islands around the world. On the other hand, 
in the rest of the world. And the reason they're such a problem is that the prey there uh, aren't have never lived with a cat. And so they've ne evolved, they haven't evolved with a predator like a cat. So they're very vulnerable. They have no defenses. And on many islands, there are no larger predators that keep that keep the cat population in check. And so the cat population gets very large and then they uh, they can be very damaging to the local species. On the other hand, in North America, it's clear that outdoor cats do kill a lot of wildlife. Whether they're threatening species is not demonstrated, although many, uh, many people think it is, but the, the evidence there isn't so strong. And then there are efforts to around cities to uh, to take care of cat colonies by uh, by sterilizing them. And there's a lot of debate on this. There are two sides, and both sides have their points. And what is so sad about this is that the two sides won't work together. That the scientists and the conservationists need to work with the people taking care of these colonies to find mutual solutions. There are certainly problems where you can't have cat colonies around an endangered seabird nest. On the other hand, are cat colonies a problem in the middle of cities? I suspect probably not, but I, I'm sure I'm saying this and people on both sides are mad at me. Uh, it's a very controversial topic. Okay. Um, let's see. I've heard cats purr to self-soothe or because they're in pain. Is that a different type of purr than the two that were discussed? So this is this is an interesting topic. I have I have read that myself. It's hard to find the actual basis for that statement. Uh, I'm unaware of any scientific study that has demonstrated that phenomenon or even looked into it. And as far as I can tell, it's more of a suggestion that perhaps is plausible, but is not based on any actual scientific data, which is actually true of a lot of things you read about cats on the internet. Um, and one of the things in writing this book was trying to track down the basis for for many claims like that, I couldn't find them. And uh, and I would ask people, you wrote on your blog this, you know, rep very reputable sources, you wrote this, what's the basis for your saying that? And they would say, they would they would kind of brush me off, but they there was no basis. So I'm a little dubious of this one. Maybe it's true. We don't know. I wouldn't call it a fact. That seems like we need a lot more cat research, right? I know Absolutely. a lot is being done, but yeah. <laughs> um, Absolutely true. Uh, okay, my cat, we had one question about the cat that doesn't meow. His main sound is a frantic ek, ek, ek when I'm getting his food. Thoughts on that? And then we had another question about a cat that's too chatty. <laughs> so just, just, you know, talking a little bit about that. So, all right, the cats, the the sounds that cats make are highly variable from one to the other. Even Even sounds that are clearly a meow, but they'll do them in many different ways. And other than the sort of research I talked about, People haven't looked haven't looked at that in in greater detail, but they're certainly highly variable. And what that means, we don't know. Um, and you know, the question is: Is that a genetic thing, or is it just how they were raised that somehow their particular growing up led them to meow in that way? Now, an ak 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 ak, that doesn't sound like a meow. It actually sounds like the noise that many cats make when they see a bird outside the window. They kind of da -da 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 -da, or ak 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 ak. And a chattering is what it's normally called. And why they do that, no one knows as well. And there are all these ideas, um, but we really don't know. And other cats being too chatty, certainly there are some. And Siamese cats are known to be the chatterboxes of the cat world. They, they basically meow nonstop. Um, and that probably does have a genetic basis, but why they're so chatty, we also don't know that. Okay, all right. Um... Do you have any thoughts on toilet training a cat? Well, so you can go online and see videos where you can train a cat to use the toilet. Essentially what you do is you put a kitty litter bowl, hang it in the toilet and it starts using the kitty litter. You train it to do that just like normal kitty litter. And then you eventually remove the kitty litter and it just poops into the toilet. Uh, I don't think you can teach them to flush the toilet, but at least it's <laughs> there. Which, you know, I scoop my cat's litter and. I would love, I've not done that, but it's, if you can do it, it sounds like a wonderful thing. It does, it does. Um, okay, a couple more. Uh, what do you think about the use of synthetic pheromones for cats? Any thoughts on that? You no, know, um, we've tried some of them. They're, they're widely recommended to 
soothe cats, particularly ones that are having behavioral problems of one sort or another. My understanding, again, I, now this is not, not a topic I looked into. I'm not sure, you know, is there a scientific basis for this or is it just an idea that sounded plausible and people ran with it and actually produced products? I can tell you, we tried it on our cats and it didn't seem very effective, but some people swear by it. Um, so I, I'm really not sure. Okay, okay. Um, all right, a any thoughts on having a, a solo cat or more than, is more than one always better? Well, I think it's nice for cats to have a, a playmate, particularly if they're gonna be left alone a lot. But if you do that, it's really better to get litter mates than to try to get one cat and then another cat. And it plays back to what I was talking about earlier, that cats form groups of related individuals. And so you take litter mates, they grow up to each other. They're hardwired to, to be friendly to each other. Um, not that it always happens that way, but conversely, if you have one cat who's living in a place and then you bring in another one, that's not a cat they know. It's not in their mind that this is, you know, a relative of my group. It's just an intruder. And, you know, sometimes if you follow what the, uh, the cat behaviors recommend, you can get them to get along okay, but other times you can't. So I think having more than one cat can be a good idea, but if, think about it beforehand and get two if, if you can. Okay, wonderful. Uh, and this is going to be our, our last one, unfortunately, but okay. we, it's, it's still. Um, are cats as native to the Americas as non-native humans who migrated from Europe? Well, that's a, you know, that is an interesting question. <laughs> are, are humans invasive species? Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, the whole, there's a, there's a lot of people considering this idea of what, what constitutes native and so on. And it can be, get into a contentious topic. Um, the fact with cats is that until people brought them over here, I think Christopher Columbus may have been the first people, unless the Vikings did. I don't think there's any strong evidence of that. So they weren't in, in, North America until 400 years ago. So it's, you know, I wouldn't call them a native species. Now, what that, you know, the implications of that are another question, but you know, they clearly came from North, North African wildcats. Okay, wonderful. Um, and I just want to remind everyone that we will send out a link to the recording tomorrow. So if, if you want to watch it again, I know there is a lot to take in, but everything fascinating. So again, Dr. Lasses, thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. We really appreciate you taking the time to, to join us tonight. Well, um, I'd also just like to thank Kimberly Young for doing such a wonderful job organizing our events. And I want to thank Maria Moiser, who's AMC's digital marketing specialist. She's the one who suggested this book to me. And so I am so glad you did. Thank you, Maria. I think you're you're still on. Um, and then just a very, very special thank you to all of you for spending part of your evening with us. And good night. We will see you next time. Thank you. Thank you very much.